This amazing chart of inflation-adjusted house prices created by Robert Schiller reveals that between 1890 and 1998, house prices track the rate of inflation very closely. In this chart, when the line is rising, houses are appreciating in price faster than the rate of inflation, and any time the line is falling, they are losing ground compared to inflation. Over this entire 118-year period, house prices averaged 101.2, meaning that inflation-adjusted house prices roughly tracked inflation across this entire sweep of history. When prices got too low, they rose, and when they got too high, they fell. See this little bump right here? That was a property bubble that I still remember clearly because it impacted the Northeast where I lived at the time, and I got to ride my bike through abandoned construction projects, which was cool. Notice that this property bubble returned to baseline in a fairly symmetrical fashion, as did the property bubble of 1989. Well, if those were property bubbles, then what's this? This housing bubble is one that has no historical precedent and is massively out of proportion to anything we've experienced before. There is nothing even remotely close to it in magnitude, so we are left without any history to guide us as to what the impacts are likely to be. And also note that this bubble did not suddenly begin in 2004. It began in 1998 and had eclipsed the past two bubbles by the year 2000. You might ask yourself if the Federal Reserve had access to this data and knew we had a property bubble on our hands as early as 2000. Why did they continue to aggressively lower interest rates to 1% and hold them there between the years 2003 and 2004? Now that's a darn good question and I'll get to that in a minute. Based on this chart, where and when might we expect this bubble to finally bottom out? Well, symmetry suggests the bottom will be somewhere around 2015, while history might suggest that prices will decline by roughly 50% in real terms. The other way that we could look at all of this is in terms of affordability. Over the long haul, it is impossible for median house prices to rise faster than median incomes. Why? Because the amount that people can afford to pay sets a limit on house prices. Here's a chart I put together that compares median incomes to median house prices. The bubbles of 1979 and 1989 are not very dramatic on this graph, but there they are, marked by the black arrows. The fact that median incomes did not deviate very far from those prior bubbly house prices helped to limit the impact of the bursting of those bubbles, painful though they were, because incomes and house prices did not have to travel very far to meet up again. This time... Again, we have no historical precedent for the gap between income gains and house prices, and we see disturbing signs as early as 1999 that things were getting seriously off track. Based on income gains alone, how much would house prices have to fall to bring these lines back together? The answer is 34% nationally, indicating that we've still got a long way to go. Given the propensity of bubbles to overshoot to the downside, we can't entirely discount that a 40 or 50 percent decline is in the cards. And here we might also guesstimate that house prices would bottom somewhere in the vicinity of 2012 to 2015. Remember, a bubble exists when asset price inflation rises beyond what incomes can sustain. And that's exactly what we see in this chart. So where was the Fed during all of this? They were busy writing research papers convincing themselves that there was no housing bubble as seen in this 2004 Fed study entitled, Our Home Prices of the Next Bubble. The main summary of this study started off on a good note, stating, Home prices have been rising strongly since the mid-1990s, prompting concerns that a bubble exists in this asset class, and that home prices are vulnerable to a collapse that could harm the U.S. economy. But then the main conclusion of the paper veered sharply off into a ditch, reading, a close analysis of the U.S. housing market in recent years, however, finds little basis for such concerns. The marked upturn in home prices is largely attributable to strong market fundamentals. Home prices have essentially moved in line with increases in family income and declines in nominal mortgage interest rates. Essentially moved in line with increases in family income? What? One of the most widely known facts of our time is that family incomes have not moved up at all over the past eight years on an inflation-adjusted basis, and is one of the principal economic failures of this decade. This just goes to show that the Federal Reserve is either stocked with inept or biased researchers, and of the two, I'm not sure which makes me feel worse about our chances of pulling through this mess. But the Fed's researchers were simply doing what millions of people did. 
namely falling prey to believing that somehow this time it's different. But that's just how bubbles are. People take leave of their senses, use all manner of rationales to justify their positions, but then suddenly, one day the illusion lifts and what seemed to be unassailably true no longer makes any sense at all. While it's tempting to lay the blame for what's happening on the housing bubble, it's important to remember that the dramatic rise in house prices was itself just a symptom of a credit bubble run amok. Total credit at the end of 2000, when the stock bubble was bursting, stood at $27 trillion. By the end of 2007, it stood at an astounding $48 trillion. This $21 trillion increase in borrowing is five times larger than the increase in U.S. GDP over the same period of time. Any attempt to understand the housing bubble has to be viewed against the backdrop of this massive increase in debt. But as we noted in an earlier chapter, this credit bubble has been going on for 25 years. Unwinding a multi-generational debt binge is going to require some enormous changes in attitudes and habits. One reason that any bubble, but especially a housing bubble like this one, is so destructive is because so many bad investments are made along the way. Too many houses were built, too many shopping centers, too many condos, and nearly all of them too large and ill-positioned for a future of expensive energy. Sorry to say, but all those trillions of dollars were wasted, and worse, stole opportunities from the things that really needed that money more. The Austrian School of Economics has a very crisp and historically accurate definition of how a credit bubble ends. According to Ludwig von Mises, there is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as a result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later, as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. This is a view I happen to ascribe to and explains my strong preference for placing my wealth out of the path of a potential dollar collapse. As a nation, we've undertaken desperate measures to avoid abandoning the continuation of our credit expansion, leaving a final catastrophe of the currency as our most likely outcome. As for the timing, it could hardly be worse. Dealing with a bursting housing bubble is not the sort of challenge we need at this particular moment in history. But, here we are. The stewardship and vision displayed by the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. in bringing all of this about has been utterly atrocious. So what can we expect from a collapsing credit bubble? Simply put, everything that fed upon and grew as a consequence of too much easy credit will collapse. I am especially leery of financial stocks and low-grade bonds, and of course, real estate. I see very few conventional ways to protect one's wealth, and so I invite you to begin asking yourself and, if you have one, you're a financial advisor, some very hard questions about the safety of your holdings. You'll be glad you did. Remember, this time it's probably not different.